And now, friends, ladies and gentlemen on Facebook, it's time once again for A Man and His Stool. For October 21st, 2024, I'm Scott Christopher. I'm the man. And uh, I'm sitting on my, well, it's not really a stool. It's more of a swivel chair, but A Man and His Stool, um, it, it just it, it packs a punch, really. It's... Um, it's some sort of, if I did man in his swivel chair, it wouldn't quite have the scatological elements that I think are really the hallmark of a great uh, internet program for the 21st uh, century. Anyway, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit of boot, uh, about a boot. Let's talk a boot a boot. Why do Canadians say a boot or a boat? Doesn't matter. Okay, uh, first up. Bing, bang, boom. Went to Nauvoo, uh, Illinois, uh, last week. Just kind of a spur of the moment. We can do that because we're empty nesters, semi-retireds. And our base of operations in Nashville, Tennessee is, um, you know, we can drive in any direction for several hours and end up in places that uh, I've been to most, but my wife has never been to. She's never driven over the Mississippi River She's never seen the Mississippi River, I don't think, up close, which is kind of cool. And so to be able to drive kind of through Hannibal, Missouri, you know, the home place of, uh, of Mark Twain, and then on up and into Iowa a little bit. These are all new sensations for her experiences. Um, and, and so we had a lot of fun in Nauvoo. It's a great historical little town for those of you that are not perhaps uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, it's very historically significant. This this little building on the hill there is not actually a little building at all. It's a very large temple, and uh, it's representative of really kind of the Latter Day Saints who built the town Nauvoo and built that temple back in the 18, early eighteen hundreds in the eighteen late eighteen thirties early eighteen forties, and then were driven from the town via vis a vis. Uh, religious persecution. It's it's symbolic, and then it was burned and destroyed, and and the stones were sold, and you know all kinds of nonsense. And then, like 160 years later, 170 years later, uh, you know the church went back and and reclaimed its property and built a new temple. And um, so we were able to go there. And I'm telling you, when you have all of that history in your head, and you kind of walk around the little streets. And there's very few actual homes and buildings left. They were all destroyed over the just time passage. Time passages. Al Stewart, look it up. Spotify it. <laughs> I know you're in there. You're just out of sight. Whoa, time passages. Al Stewart, to me, and the Pet Shop Boys essentially sound like the same, you know. You've got the looks, I've got the brains, time passages. So that was Nauvoo. Um, <laughs> we both had a really nice, just positive spiritual experience there. And um, being in the temple, uh, then going to Carthage Jail, which is about a half hour away, we learned it's a six-hour horse ride where Joseph and his brother Hiram and a few others voluntarily turned themselves in for destroying a, pre a printing press, which, because they didn't like what was being, it was the Nauvoo Expositor. And so it was uh, kind of an anti-LDS uh, print uh, publication. And they were riling up the people and they had already been subjected to violence and, and terror and mobs. And... It's interesting because I was listening to another podcast uh, uh, over the weekend, or maybe while we were even driving to or from Nauvoo, in which they said, you know, the American right, the, the, the Bill of Rights that includes the freedom of the press, really wasn't added until several decades, I believe, after this even occurred. And it wasn't even really codified until the early 20th century. And so even for me, it was like when I heard that Joseph Smith had gone in and taken this printing press and bashed it to pieces, I was kind of like, that was pretty rash, you know, being a full blue-blooded American uh, to do that. But when you understand the time and place and that, again, that, that uh, 
that's our constitutional right to free press. That really wasn't a thing when that occurred. Um, that was just the mayor of the town and the leader of the church who was essentially saying, you know, you're, you're, you're evoking violence and saying, telling lies and being nasty, libelous. And, you know, in frontier America, that's how people dealt with those kinds of situations. If you take the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, or whatever the amendment, whatever it was, the freedom, the free press, if you just remove that for a minute and pretend like it's not there, which it wasn't at the time, it kind of, you know, anyway. So he turned himself in and then they, a mob of 200 uh, anonymous people with blackened faces barged down the door of the, of the jail and murdered he and his brother in cold blood. So the crime, I'm not sure the history of, of crimes, if uh, cold-blooded murder um, equates with the smashing of a printing press pre freedom of the press era, uh, if, that, if that balances out. But anyway, the, uh, the temple stands now as a, a very visible on the bluff overlooking the Mississippi River reminder that, um, you know, you can drive us out when we're weakened and hungered and terrorized. But, but when we do have the freedom now, we're going to go back and, and uh, it's neat. Okay. Uh, if you have questions, I can answer those later for you. You know, I... Let's move on to the next topic. Woohoo! Seven and O. Oh. Holy crabapple. Um, I don't know what to think, though, because I probably, like many of you, um, or many of you maybe not even, aren't, maybe aren't even BYU fans, um, but it's still a pretty cool story, the fact that they were, you know, picked to finish near the bottom of the Big 12 that they were supposed to win only four and a half games out of 12. I love numbers. How do you win half a game? But anyway, um, I know it's just statistical outputs, but still, round it up or round it down, four and a half. Anyway, and so at this point, they haven't lost. You know, they, they are seven and oh, and they only moved up to, I think, maybe 11th in the AP poll and still 12th or 13th in the coaches poll. Um, and there are a couple of three or four teams ahead of them with one loss. Now, many will make the argument that, well, those are SEC teams. So those are big 10 teams. They're teams that have tougher schedules. BYU's in a power four conference now. They're not playing patsies. They're even their preseason game with SMU was considered a power four game. They've beaten teams that have only lost to BYU at this point. Um, even still, I hesitate uh, to get all celebratory because I watch them and I go, we still just haven't really, we've won by the skin of our teeth or even if we've killed them, it was like it was all defense or all magical cool plays. Even this last weekend when they beat Oklahoma State for the first time ever, which was so great. But even just the magic, I mean, boy, it's been a while since we've had a cool ending like that. If you haven't had a chance to see that game, I'm sure BYU TV will be airing it every summer for the next 50 summers um, in the off season when they're showing like BYU highlights and classics. Great game. Very entertaining. Um. I, I'm, I, I hope that, they, and now the, the dialogue is that they might actually be in not just a New Year's bowl game, not just one of the big cool games, but those, those bowl games now are the playoffs. And so many of the, the nationwide pundits are saying that they'll be a four seed, a six seed, a nine seed of the 12 seeds. And that's exciting. At this point, really, if they were to go seven and five from here on out, we would all be really disappointed. But if we could just think back to like two months ago when we were just hoping that they might get bowl eligible when we were five and seven the previous season, eh, no, seven and five would be a real kick in the cojones. You know what I mean? But um, anyway, 
Go Cougs. Uh, moving on. Don't want to take all day. It's just not the way it is. So I'll say it. I'll be honest because I'm old now. But on days when I'm not doing anything, I will go drive Uber. Uh, it's less an economical uh, necessity as it is just a necessity to stay busy, to do something. Plus the fact that I live in a whole new neck of the woods and I want to get to know the, the, the town, the roads, the highways, the systems. And I have had some of the coolest, neatest experiences um, just picking up people as you do with Uber. Some of you that are watching have probably driven Uber uh, and if you haven't and you are in my age group and you're slowing down or, and I hope not to be slowing down. I mean, I don't want to slow down. When I say I'm semi-retired, that's by force. I mean, there's just things I've been working on that aren't going right now. <laughs> um, but I have all of the energy, vim, and vigor to still be working every day for many, many hours. And so I very often we'll just say, honey, I'm going driving today and I'll leave for anywhere from three to 10 hours, you know, and just go drive around. But when I was doing that in Utah, it was a little difficult because so many people that I would pick up, it was a very uncomfortable moment. They're like, don't I know you? Aren't you in stuff? Were you the guy in the, and it was kind of fun, but it was also a little because I'm a human embarrassing to be like, hey, even though an actor who's in a handful of roles isn't above any job. And I actually love ferrying people a boot. Um, but still, it's kind of like, yeah, that's me. And then they start the whole, what did I see you in? And then you, you go, I don't know, because you can't play that game. If you start giving them best two years, they'll, they'll say, what's that? Or, no, never heard of it. And then it's just embarrassing to you. So I'll usually just go, yeah, yeah, you can look it up. Look up Scott Christopher on imdb.com and go through the credits and, you know. But here in Nashville, I have been operating under a, a shroud of anonymity, which is great because, um, you know, most of the people that bother me, no, never, never, it's never a bother. Um, but most of the people that do say hello or recognize me or give me that look, they're mostly LDS and mostly from Utah. <laughs> um, fame is far and wide from one end of Utah Valley to the other end of Davis County. Um, but I, admittedly, I have done a few Hollywood things, uh, even if they've been small roles. So I picked up this family from the airport the other day who were flying in from Denver or somewhere. And they were giving me these looks and, and they got in the car and I was like, oh boy, here we go. I hadn't had this in a long time. And the lady in the back was like, man, we really think you look familiar. Why are you in things? Do you do movies? And I'm like, okay, here we go. And I was like, you know, I have been an actor. I've done a few things. I said, you know, you, you wouldn't happen to be members of the Latter-day Saint faith, right? And they said, no. <laughs> Just like that. No. Um, and I said, well, I have done some other kind of other, you know, shows, uh, NCIS or Modern Family. And I've done some Hallmark. Hallmark! And that was it. They immediately went, you're in Hallmark Christmas movies. Now, I'm telling you, I've been in like five, four or five. I don't know. And I don't have huge roles in these things. And by the way, anyone that's shooting Hallmark Christmas movies, just because I've moved to Tennessee doesn't mean I can't come back to Utah and be in these doggone things. Uh, just reach out, for heaven's sakes. But anyway, um, <laughs> they knew me from Hallmark. Uh, it, was a, it was an odd, and they were gushing. They're like, oh my gosh, we watch every one of those. That's right, you were in the one with um, the girl from Full House. I had a small part in that one. Uh, you were in another one with the dead, and, and it was like, it was crazy. So, so drive Uber. And by the way, there's a lot to talk about, about driving Uber. A lot of little tips and things that I wish I would have known before I just threw my hat into the ring. But I've been doing it for like seven years, and I still only have driven maybe 600 trips in seven years. Because, like I say, it's kind of a time filler, but it is an awful lot of fun. 
Um, oh boy. Wow. I just don't even know what to say here. I feel like I always have to say something about the presidential election race. And usually it's the same old thing for me, which is how in the world in a country of 300 million people, 400, I don't know what it's up to now. We can end up with, with, uh, these choices. And, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, it's, it's the platform, not the person. And some of will say it's the person and the platform and others say it's neither, it's both. You know, I don't know. I still don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm studying it out. Um, for me, the person really matters for some reason that just really, really matters to me. Uh, I, you know, I've lived 57 years now. And, and my nation has survived platforms. We go through periods of platform change and we just sort of, we may not like it. And so the next election cycle, we'll try to do something about it. But there's so much divisiveness, so much anger, so much vitriol in the past eight, 12 years, however long it's been since one of these candidates has been running. It's like the entire political discourse in America has taken on such a rabid, mean, extreme view um, that it saddens me that there were times when President Carter won. And I didn't vote for President Carter. Of course, I was only 10. Um, but you just, you still call him Mr. President and he's our president. I didn't, I probably wouldn't have voted for JFK as far as long as I know, but I, I know that I love JFK and the things that he did. And and you may not have voted for Ronald Reagan, but he was an amazing unifier and he did great things for the country. I, I really I, I really think that um, things were different then. People just kind of went, oh, too bad, we lost. And now it's, oh, I'm not going to lose. There must be some conspiracies. It's broken. They cheated. And then let's get everyone riled up. It's like, whoa, whoa, you lost. It's okay. We'll get them next time. Our platform will eventually win again. But our particular people who are kind of out there, yeah, that concerns me. I'm sorry to say. Um, but also the Democratic platform has a lot of red flags for me. Uh, Kamala Harris, though, uh, I mean, honestly, for me, Sure, she's 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 playing the political ga games that all political candidates play. You move to the center during an election season. You know, you go against your history, or you you flat out deny it, or blah blah blah. We everyone has done that, and Trump is certainly no different. Dude started as a Democrat for heaven's sakes. He was just looking for a chance to have power. But that's just me. Let's end uh, on a positive note, if I have one. <laughs> yesterday, I want to I want to end on this. Yesterday was the primary program at my son's ward in Hendersonville, Tennessee. And I believe they've just released the the woman who was over the music in primary, but this was her swan song. And uh, I think she comes from a family of professional musicians. Um, so every primary program has been incredibly well-rehearsed, choreographed, lots of rehearsals. I mean, it's nothing like the vast majority of Ward's primary programs. For those of you that don't know, a primary program are the little kids doing, taking the whole meeting on Sunday and singing different songs. And... Um, I took a bunch of videos because I was just so blown away at the quality. Now, we do hear that, oh, music in church is not about performance. It's about praise. No question about it. Um, but in the case of the primary, I, I give a little leeway because the spirit was so strong uh, of all the work that they did, all the work that this woman and the other adults that serve in there must have done um, was just awesome. Let me just... Let me just play. This is just this was the fir first number. I mean, she gets these kids to do duets and solos, and they actually can keep a tune. Check this. Where'd it go? 
Where is it? Oh. Hold on. They're, they're just so doggone adorable. But I mean, all of the kids sang in the choir, even my little grandson, Harry. I can't believe he stayed up there the whole time. He's three and a half. No, he's four. He's four. But I mean, he sang and he played little bells and, and my son played, a, played the guitar for one of their songs. And I mean, again, I've in the past, I've had issues with like, being too slickly produced with musical numbers in church because it just tends to be a distraction from the spirit of things because it's like, look at me, look at me, aren't I talented? Having said that, I do recognize that many people who are talented and who lend their gifts in a sacrament meeting are doing it out of their love of the Savior and their desire to serve. So that's why I'm always a little, I give myself a little leeway on that whole rule of it's not performance, it's it's praise and worship. Um, but in these primary programs, I must say, in certain wards or other church units, the primary kids can barely keep a tune. You can hardly hear them. There might be only four or five kids. This was actually a fairly small little choir, little primary. But even in those, the spirit isn't any weaker, and it isn't any stronger in the ones where they do it big where they, you know, are type A and do everything exactly. Um, in fact, I was shown that very thing yesterday, that uh, there's a great spirit of truth um, in those primary kids singing and the fact that they worked so hard and did so well, whereas in other wards, they kind of seem to not care, let's just get through it. Spirit's still good. Um, and I shouldn't say that. There aren't kids that ever say, let's just get through it. Well, no, I did. In all honesty, I must have done that. So, anywho, that's a quick look uh, at October 21st, uh, 2024. <laughs> I guess it was really a week in review. It wasn't just a day in review, because none of these things actually happened today. For a man and his stool, I'm Scott Christopher. Enjoy. Being done with this. <laughs>